Hello and welcome to the Agile Leadership Network's webinar series. If you'd like advanced notice about future webinars and other events, go to agileleadershipnetwork.org and click on the Join button to join the mailing list or use the specific URL below on the slide. Thank you and welcome again. The Agile Leadership Network presents Rich Sheridan and Joy, Inc. In this webinar, you will discover why last year almost 2,200 visitors came from around the world to visit Menlo Innovations, a small software company in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in the United States. You will also discover why Joy, in the context of business, sounds ridiculous. It would be, except that it produces measurable, repeatable, and sustainable results. You'll also learn why physical space affects team energy and engagement. Within an industry known for missed deadlines, poor quality, death march projects, and user experiences that require dummies books to explain, Rich will deliver the hope of a better way, removing the fear and ambiguity that typically make a workplace miserable. With joy as the explicit goal for Menlo's staff, as well as their clients and the people who use the products they create, Rich and his team changed everything about how the company was run. Now he offers an inside look at how all this was accomplished and what you can do to inject joy into your workplace for sustainable business results and personal satisfaction. All right, Rich, welcome. And um, you're going to tell a little bit of your story as you go through this. So without further ado, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, having, thanks for having me and uh, happy to join you all today. The subject of today's webinar is joy, which is an unusual topic in any context, I think, but particularly in a business context. And um, what I want to do is talk with you about this concept as, as people look at Agile and they look at process and they look at methodology, how is it that we can actually get to something more meaningful, more purposeful than perhaps some of us have gotten to? And I share this story in my book, and I'm going to share it with you today in this webinar. Most organizations don't really spend much time thinking about their culture. Most organizations operate in chaos. Everyone wants to work on something that's bigger than themselves. I did. I started out in an industry that I was very excited about. Very quickly I hit a trough of disillusionment. And by 1997 when I was promoted to Vice President of Product Development, I wanted out. I wanted to get as far away from this industry as I could. And then in that moment I decided to change the industry. And that's the story that I've captured in this book. People are coming from all over the planet to come visit this space that's in the basement of a parking structure in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. And they're coming for a reason. They're coming to see something. What most people are looking for is some lessons around what it takes to build an intentionally joyful culture. Imagine half of my team had joy and the other half didn't. Which half would you want working on your project? We had so many requests for these tours, we realized it was time to share this story with the world in a different way. And that's how the book came to be. The space is flexible. We work two to a computer, we assign these pairs, we switch them every five working days. The human energy that results from this kind of organization, you can actually feel the joy when you're in the room. My name is Richard Sheridan, and I'm the author of Joy, Inc. So why would I talk about joy in the context of Agile and software process and so on? And I will tell you that part of this for me is quite personal. I got into this industry when I was just a kid. I was so excited about it. Uh, I, um, I believed that software design and development was probably one of the most unique endeavors mankind had ever undertaken. And at a certain point in my career, I realized I had gone from that joy of a little kid to the fear of operating in an environment where I was away from family more than I wanted to be. 
I was canceling vacations both for me and the people who worked for me, and I quickly moved from this environment of, fear, of joy to an environment of fear. And I saw at the same time moving from the chaos of never getting anything done to the bureaucracy of never getting anything started. And quite frankly, I was the arsonist in charge of this whole thing. Um, uh, my teams were producing more problems than they were solving. Um, the phones were ringing off the hook. I wanted out. I wanted out of the whole industry, quite frankly, because what I saw was this disillusionment for me, for the people who work for me, and quite frankly, now that I've seen it, I've seen it in our entire industry. Projects that never end up seeing the light of day. Projects that never get done. Uh, projects that do get done and then they, uh, they don't work right. Or if they do work the way they were created to work, then they frustrate the users. And I, I just thought there had to be a better way than was customary, and I was determined to find it. And, um, and that's... Uh, uh, what led me to, in 1999, a click moment, uh, as Franz Johansson describes in his book, uh, I, I think it falls into the same category of fortune uh, 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 favors the prepared mind. And I had been preparing myself for this click moment for at least a decade, reading books not on technology development, not on software development, not on process and methodology, but books on human organizations, books on design of organizations. And then in 1999, I read Kent Beck's book, Stream Programming Explained. I also um, saw a video on an industrial design firm in California called IDEO. And suddenly, after a decade of searching, I knew exactly where I was headed. And that's how Menlo came to be. And I'm going to take you through a little picture book tour of Menlo here so you can see some of the pieces and parts. For some of you, this may be familiar uh, in the sense that uh, you've, you've tried some of these experiments yourselves. For others, maybe you've only heard of these kind of experiments and you want to see a living, breathing example. So the question I pose here is joy visible. Can you see it? Can you feel it? Can you touch it? Can you experience it? And a lot of people come to see us. Uh, we did over 340 tours last year for 2,500 people who came from around the planet to see, as I call it, the basement of a parking structure in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. The first thing we did was we tore down the walls. It, literally in this space when we moved in here, there was more of a tear out than it was a build out. There are no barriers to human communication at Menlo. There's a lot of articles written these days about the vilified open and collaborative workspace. Uh, Fast Company Magazine re recently published an article saying that these kind of environments, the wide open office with everybody sitting in close proximity, is an idea born in the mind of Satan and conceived in the deepest caverns of hell. Um, and then people send me these articles and they say, Rich, why is it that it works for Menlo? And why do all these other people say that the psychologists have the data to prove that these environments don't work? And I had to think hard about that because I've been operating in this environment now for 15 years. And I realized that the difference was we didn't build an open and collaborative workspace. We built an open and collaborative culture and we fit our workspace to our culture. And I think that's the key difference is that where did we start from? What was our mindset we went, when we went into it? We do embrace noise, uh, but it is the noise of work. Uh, this is not a library quiet environment. Uh, we have very few rules at Menlo, but one of them is you can't wear earbuds while you're working and we are an in-person company. If you're going to work on a project at Menlo, you actually have to be in the room. And so it's a very flexible space. These pull downs from the ceiling, the lightweight tables allow the team to change the space however they want. But it is a noisy environment, sort of like a coffee shop or a restaurant but it's the noise of people actually doing project work. <clears throat> and you can see that work. You can see it in place. The team is in charge of the physical space. They, they get to form it however they want. And for all of our years, uh, they have chosen to push the table side to side and front to front. That's how close they want to sit together because they're completely in charge of how the, the space gets set up. 
we're also, as we say, very flexible as we can move the space around however we want and the team does. We're also very visual. Uh, we practice a lot of the components of what they talk about in Lean and making your process vis visible. And in making it visible, we also make it very transparent, which begins to pump fear out of the room, which I think is a, a big part of our culture. And we built a learning organization, as Peter Senge describes in the fifth discipline. And yes, we have a lot of books here. We have a lot of bookshelves. Uh, we have books everywhere. Uh, it's a very open lending policy. If you see a book you want to read, you just take it. You don't have to check it out. Uh, but it's not about the book learning here. It's not only about the book learning here. It's about creating a system that people can learn every minute of every day. And that's where we rely on putting two heads together at every computer. We work in pairs. Uh, not only do we get their heads together, we get their hearts together. Uh, it's enjoyable. It feels safe. Um, this system is fostered by introverts. Um, Introverts prefer fewer, deeper, safer relationships, and they get that here. They put their hands together as they work together, and they do it all at a single computer. These pairs are assigned, and we switch them every five working days. I'm sure there will be questions about this afterwards. And then we support all of this not with meetings, but with what we would like to think of more as conversations with human rituals and the artifacts that support them. And I love this quote from John Naisbert in the Megatrends book that he wrote in the early 80s. And I, I'm amazed that he wrote this 20 years before the 21st century started. And I think it's so much more true today that the most exciting breakthroughs of the 21st century will not occur because of technology, but because of an expanding concept of what it means to be human. And that's very much at work here at Menlo. Yes, we have this big, open, noisy environment. And when we communicate internally, when we communicate with one another, we don't use electronics. We don't use email. We use what we like to call high-speed voice technology, the vocal cords, the eyebrows, the body language, the folded arms across your chest, the tonal inflection of your voice, very high fidelity. If we want to call a meeting across the room, I could say, hey, Mike. And Mike would say, hey, Rich, and we're in a meeting now. Or if I want to call a meeting with the Wilmot team, I would say, hey, Wilmot, and the entire Wilmot team would say, hey, Rich, and now we're in a meeting. If I want to call an all-company meeting, I could stand in the middle of the room and call out a slightly louder voice, hey, Menlo, and everyone will say, hey, Rich, and the place will go completely silent. We're now in an all-company meeting and nobody moved. And that isn't just reserved for me. Anybody can call those kind of meetings, and they do when there's a need to do that. We do have a daily stand-up meeting. It's our one sort of acquiescence to meetings. Uh, it's called by a dartboard on the wall. The dartboard has an alarm. Why the dartboard has an alarm, I have no idea, but we used it. It's programmed to go up at 10 o'clock every morning. And this bonging sound starts, and everyone in the room hears the bonging. They get up, and they, they all gather in a big circle. And you know, here there might be 40 or 50 people in our daily stand-up meeting. And when I say everybody comes, I really mean everybody comes, including the dogs. The dogs get really excited about this kind of environment because um, they, they like the energy, the human energy in the room. We grab a plastic Viking helmet, which is kind of the iconic symbol of Menlo, but the reason we like the Viking helmet is just simply that it has two horns, two handles. We report out in the pairs that are working together. And here's a picture of Tracy and Joe reporting out, a picture of Nate and Katie reporting out, Thomas and Carol reporting out. Then the token goes back down on the table, and we say, be careful out there. And our stand-up meeting of 50 or 60 people goes smoothly. People report out what they're working on. They report out where they need help. And the meeting concludes in 13 minutes or less. I defy most organizations to begin a meeting of 60 people in 13 minutes, let alone call it, assemble it, start it, hold it, and give everyone a chance to report out, complete it, and get back to work in 13 minutes. And I think this is the key to, if you will, some of the Menlo magic. How is it that we can be so successful in using this kind of environment as the way we engage our clients? We pull them into a show and tell every five working days. 
and what we do is we put the client in charge of the show and tell. The gentleman in the blue shirt at the computer sitting there with the keyboard and mouse in his hand is our sponsor. He's the champion of the project. He's the one who's authorizing the invoices to pay us to do the work we do, which is software design and development on a contract basis for our clients. And this is Kuhn, and he's actually demonstrating the work we did the previous five days to the people who did the work. And so this pulls our customer back into the context of what we're working on. It keeps them engaged because we find that the human relationships between the tribes, between the business tribes, the IT tribes, and the user tribes is the most important thing we can do in our process and our approach. And that's what gets us to this very specific definition of joy we have here at Memo. And that is we want to see the work that happens in our room get out into the world, be widely adopted, and delight the people for whom it's intended. And everything we do is focused on that as a goal. There is joy inside of these meetings, but there's also consternation. The customer can get frustrated. The customer can look at us and say, hey, that's not what we meant. And our answer is awesome. We worked on this, this part of the project for four hours last week, and less than five days later we found out we got it wrong. There's an ultimate uh, uh, operating system value at work here at Menlo that we call make mistakes faster. And it's not about making mistakes. We don't value making mistakes. What we value is making them quickly so we can correct them while they're still small. We also pull our client into a weekly planning activity that's paper-based. Uh, we find that the client behaves better when they can use simple tools, simple tools that engage humans. We fold our story cards, our handwritten story cards, to the size of the estimate. This customer is holding a four-hour card. Here's an eight-hour card that's twice as big as four. The client will physically move these little folded slips of paper onto our planning sheets. This is an engaging conversation between Lisa, uh, the project manager, um, our, our client uh, who's standing in the middle, Carol and Megan on the edges, uh, who are two of our high-tech anthropologists and are having an active discussion. The client often brings multiple stakeholders into the table. They talk about all the pieces that are involved in our process, and they're moving these little folded pieces of paper onto the planning sheets. And as soon as they do that, they're authorizing us to do work. If the pieces of paper are still on the table, they've not yet decided to authorize that, and it's completely unambiguous type of planning. <coughs> Our clients get very engaged in this discussion. They, 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 they read these cards because the cards are short. They're concise. They're to the point. They're written in the language that the client can understand. So they're willing to invest themselves in actually learning what it is we're working on because they know they're going to see the results of it less than five days later. The very active engagement, the conversation between us and our client. This is uh, our client in the blue shirt, our project manager John in the middle, and my co-founder James Goble off to the right-hand edge of the screen. The artifacts we use are simple. They're paper-based. They're handwritten. Uh, there's no work that can happen in our room unless it's first written down on this five and a half inch by eight and a half inch index card. Those index cards are estimated, they're planned, they're folded to the size of the plan, and then they're put up on the wall for everyone to see. We, we use this visual management system, which a lot of people think is funny for a software company to use a paper-based visual management system. But our attitude is, let's choose the tools that work better for the humans. Each card has its own story. Uh, they're placed next to the day we expect them to complete based on the estimate that came from the team themselves. And the cards are status is updated with little circular sticky dots. A yellow dot says that's what we're working on now. An orange dot says we think we're done. And we emphasize think we're done because often programmers have as many different definitions for done as Eskimos have words for snow. You know, it's done but it's not finished. It worked on my machine. So in our world we have to be very explicit about what we think we're done is, and then QA comes and checks their work. If QA doesn't like what they see, you get a red dot, and you have to go back to yellow to figure out what went wrong and fix it. And if QA does like what they see, they put a green dot in your card, and then they sign it. And that's the endorphin rush that says we're actually done with the card, and it's ready for that show and tell process I showed earlier. We apply the power of observation in making sure that whatever we build will delight the end users, which is our ultimate goal. 
we use an anthropological approach. We, we go out and we study people and we study them in their na native environment. We observe them doing work. We don't ask them how they want the software to work. We watch them work today. We learn their vocabulary. We learn their workflow, their habits, and then we design something that fits into their existing system. And this is incredibly powerful. We have a set of people on our team we call high-tech anthropologists. And their job is to be these silent observers of human behavior and then ultimately take what they learn, bring it back to Menlo, and design the user experiences that our programmers will eventually turn into working software. I'll give you a simple example of how powerful this can be. We did a handheld touch screen device once for diesel motor mechanics. The first thing that our, our anthropologists observed when they were watching Bubba working on a bus at the local transit authority was that he wore rubber gloves when he worked. They simply noted down that he wore rubber gloves and then later asked our client, are, were they concerned if they were going to be wearing rubber gloves because it was a capacitive touch screen that wouldn't work when they were wearing rubber gloves. Our client who had been in the business for 30 years was stunned that their users wore rubber gloves when they worked. They were shocked and then finally one of their engineers fessed up and he said, man, you guys are so lucky. He says, I've been here 12 years. I've never even met one of our end users and you got to meet one within the first two hours of the project. It's not that hard, but as we know, simple things often aren't easy and just simply going out and observing people is critical to our, our view of how to make all of this work. We catalog the people that we discover. This is a persona map for, in this case, a fictional project uh, that we make up for our training classes. It's uh, uh, cataloged to indicate who would be a primary persona for somebody who might use a wedding planning site, an online wedding planning site. And this is how we uh, argue with our clients about who the primary persona is, who the secondary personas are who the tertiary personas are. We use this targeted map to do that. And then who are the people who we discovered along the way who are not going to focus any design attention on? Because one of the things you uh, find in any walk of life is that a uh, company or business or product or service often defines itself at least as much by what you choose to say no to as what you choose to say yes to. And this is our way to define what we've chosen to say no to and who we've chosen to say yes to. All design decisions that are made from this point forward are played through this tool. In this particular case, Kathleen is the primary persona. So every feature, every button, every idea we're going to add into the software is going to be filtered through Kathleen. We'll ask ourselves, how will this work for Kathleen? What would Kathleen think about this? Would this work? Is this the way Kathleen thinks? Will this be valuable to Kathleen? And Kathleen in this particular case is the mother of the bride and she's the primary persona that was chosen for this particular project. And the idea isn't that we're going to exclude everyone else, but we're going to make Kathleen primary. If Amy the bride who's in the third layer of this persona map is somebody we're going to add a feature for, then our question becomes great. We're going to add a feature in for Amy. How do we add it in in a way that doesn't interfere with Kathleen's use of the software? and critical portion of how we do design and how we think about the end user community we're trying to serve. Our anthropologists bring that information back. They use a variety of brainstorming techniques and storyboarding techniques and mind mapping techniques, whiteboarded tables and so on to collect, synthesize, and ultimately assemble the screen designs that our programmers will turn into working software. I'm going to finish with a story, and it's a story about Menlo babies. Um, but it's not about babies. It's about fighting fear. It's about embracing change in your organization. And there's a tagline here at Menlo that we use to fight fear here. And we, we often hear the phrase uttered around the room, let's run the experiment. Seven years ago today, little Maggie Beeson was born. Uh, it happens to be Maggie's birthday, but about three months after Maggie was born, Tracy, her mom, came in and she said to me, she says, Rich, I'm ready to come back to work. She says, the only problem is Maggie's too young for daycare and we don't have family members in the area. We're not sure what to do. And I looked at Tracy and I said, bring her in. She said, what do you mean? I said, bring her into work. She says, all day? And I said, sure. And she said, every day? And I said, why not? And she looked around this big open room that we have here and she said, where will I put her? 
I said, Tracy, she's not going anywhere. She's three months old. Put her in a bassinet on the floor wherever you're working. She says, yeah, but what if she makes a fuss? I said, here? It's like a noisy restaurant. You'll never hear it. She said, yeah, but what if she really makes a fuss? I said, Tracy, you're the mom. I trust you. We'll figure it out together. Let's run the experiment. Let's not defeat the idea before we've even tried something. The baby on the screen is Ellie. Her father, Greg, is holding her while they're working. Ellie is Menlo baby number eight. This has been a very successful experiment for us. We love having the babies in the room. It brings more human energy to the place. It makes us seem more, I don't know, more human. Uh, this is Ellie at a meeting uh, within uh, the team. Uh, this is Tracy, uh, Maggie's mom. And this is uh, Henry, uh, memo baby number seven. Fern is there too, the dog. Uh, this is John, Henry's dad, holding Henry. And we actually found this is an interesting side effect of our experiment. We found that our customers behave better when there's a baby at the meeting. Who knew that was going to be uh, part of our marketing system to bring babies to the meeting? And then we found our customers started participating in our process. They started to bring their own kids here. This is Henry asking around the team, hey, how's it going? What you working on? Are you almost done coming in this weekend? Um, our customers started playing. They started bringing their dogs. This is Buster, a great name that our customers in the orange shirt has brought in and asked permission. Said, is it okay if I bring my dog in? He said, sure. We didn't realize he was bringing in a great Dane, but he started participating in our, in our culture, which I think is an awesome way to um, uh, build relationship with your clients. And ultimately, as I say, this is not about dogs and babies. This is about creating an atmosphere that says, let's not try and defeat ideas before we try something. Let's run the experiment. This is the way you get past fear and get to building a, a, a joyful environment, one that the team is engaged and energized, who wants to be there every morning, who wants to be part of the team, who wants to help you succeed. That's what we're really trying to do here. And in amongst all the fun and in amongst all the, the excitement and how we engage in the relationships we build with each other, with pairing and the relationships we build with our clients, with planning game and show and tell and babies and dogs and all that sort of thing, there is also an incredible rigor and discipline that operates just below the surface here at Menlo. One example of that is our ardent use of automated unit testing frameworks, a well-understood tool. I first learned about these kind of approaches in 1980 just as I was graduating from the University of Michigan with a computer science degree. They didn't become well-known until Kent Beck and Martin Fowler started writing about them in Martin's book, Refactoring, in the year 2000. But they're still largely ignored today, even though these tools are simple, they're powerful, they're living, breathing versions of documentation. We write all of our code, first with tests and then the code to fit into the tests. And the effect is dramatic. Our phones don't ring with problems. The last time the team remembers a software emergency is 2004. That's incredible. And uh, I won't say that's directly 100% attributable to automated unit testing frameworks, but this takes so many problems off the table. It automates uh, the, uh, the quality assurance level of things here to such a high degree that allows the team to work on a lot of the other quality things without worrying about the little things that could go wrong in software. And there's so much of that kind of rigor and discipline here because we care so much about the outcome. Ultimately, what I wanted to do back in those days of disillusionment, back in that time where I wanted out of the industry because I was so frustrated, I started reading books. This is one of the books that greatly affected me in the earliest days. Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline, The Art and Practice of the Learning Organization, where he says, in the long run, the only sustainable source of competitive advantage is your organization's ability to learn faster than your competition. We have to build learning organizations if we're going to stay ahead, if we're going to keep up. That's important. I'll leave it open for questions now. Uh, a lot of the stories I've told here are captured in the book, Joy, Inc. Uh, it's available everywhere. 
Um, if you do happen to pick up a copy and read it, I'd love to hear from you. Reach out to me and let me know what you think. And I will turn it back over to you, Mike, for questions. Great. Thanks, Rich. I especially appreciate all the visuals. Um, I will get the URL to the video um, that you showed at the beginning. We had a little bit of a problem with the sound, and we'll post that on our events page on the website so people can get to it. So um, with that, if you would like to ask questions, either use the Q&A button or by chat. So Rich, here's one to start with. Um, you showed an open environment. Does everyone work on the same product, or are they working on different products? Yeah, so we are a software design and development firm that works uh, on a contract basis with our customers. So all of our clients are external to the organization. All the projects we're working on are external to our company. And so right now we have 14 active projects here at Menlo. Uh, so the people in the room are working, they're organized around each of the projects. And the teams go to the projects, the projects don't come to the team. And by that I mean that the physical space is actually organized around each of the projects. Okay, great. So I, I gather that for the most part, I mean, this is a combination of um, joy. Is a combination of premeditation but also elaboration, correct? Yes. Uh, you know, we, we started out with this cultural intention from the beginning. I'm just showing some of the artifacts that indicate the types of projects. Every one of these uh, screen, uh, every one of these um, funny names, Ahab, Cosmos, Zerm, and so on, is, um, uh, is a different project that we're working on. And uh, so yes, uh, the, the cultural intention was there from the beginning, and many of the practices that you see uh, that I talk about here were present at the beginning. But we're constantly experimenting and expanding and trying new things and seeing what works and improving it, uh, because we understand that a process can't remain fixed. It, it, it needs to itself be a, a part of the learning organization to adjust it over time. Right. I'm so not part sure of, if that's what you were asking about. Yes. So part of the learning organization and part of experimentation is also recognizing that with risk comes the chance of failure. So could you tell us two things? One, um, what do you do, and I'll say this in terms of non-joyful organizations, what do you do to people when there's failure? And secondly, could you give us an example of one of the experiments that didn't work out like you wanted it to along the way? Yeah, so it's funny that there's so many experiments that come and go. Sometimes it's hard to uh, remember the ones that didn't work. Um, I'll, I'll give a simple version uh, of one that didn't work. Uh, and, I, and sometimes we don't even know why. This is kind of a trivial experiment, but it's for whatever reason one that came to mind. Uh, as the daily stand-up got bigger and bigger, um, uh, we didn't have any trouble with the timing of it. It still moved along just fine, but we had trouble with our outside voices and people speaking up loud enough so that everybody in the circle could hear because a lot of people aren't used to using their outside voice at work. And so I went out and bought a big plastic ear, and when the token, the Viking helmet was moving around, the ear was moving around the other side of it, and if you couldn't hear the other side, you'd raise the ear over your head. And that would be just the simple indication that I can't hear you talk louder. Nah, that didn't work. The plastic ear is sitting in a box somewhere in the other back room, and I'm not sure why it didn't work. but. Uh, it's typical of an experiment here is if we'll try something, we'll try it again and again. If it doesn't work, we just toss it aside. There's not a lot of ceremony around failure here, uh, nor is there a lot of consternation about it. Um, I, I think you asked earlier about people failing, I think. If, uh, oh, I think I lost sight of that first question. Well, and so along with that, one of the things that happens if you want to run experiments, if you want to take risks, is you have to address the question of what do you then do if there is a failure, right? What then happens yep. if anything to people? So if there's a failure, how do you handle it? Yep. And so a big part of our cultural norms here is to pump fear out of the room. And I consider that one of my 
and my co-founders' uh, biggest um, responsibilities is to work as hard as we can to be the leaders, the visionary leaders for keeping fear out of the room. The biggest problem with fear in the room, in any room, uh, regardless of what company it is, is fear makes bad news going to hiding. Bad news doesn't go away. It just goes into hiding. And, it, and then you end up not making little mistakes quickly. You end up, end up making one really big mistake very slowly. And so uh, I will just point to uh, one of our cultural norms here along this line. And it was uh, fostered by my co-founder, James Goebel, and perpetuated by one of our senior developers, Ted. And the way it worked was in the earliest days when we started feeling fear coming into the room at the beginning of the company, James went to the team, he pulled them all together, and he says, okay, here's how it's going to work from now on. Anything that goes wrong here, it's my fault. Blame me. And I'm not sure the team quite, know how to, quite knew how to read James on that one, but Ted figured it out very quickly. When something later that day or that week went wrong the very first time, Ted just threw his arm across him and he says, it's James' fault. And everybody laughed, but they got it. They realized, oh, we're not here to find fault. We're not here to assign blame. We're not here. We've already assigned the blame. Now let's go solve the problem. And it's really interesting. That, that was 13 years ago when we started the company. still exists today. People still point across the room, it's James' fault. And then everybody laughs and then they just move on because they realize now we've removed the fear of identifying who made the mistake. Now we can focus on the problem rather than the people. And I think those, those kind of simple constructs are really important. And, and there's a whole bunch of them uh, that we have here, but that's, that's just a straightforward one that I can describe quickly in this uh, webinar. Oh, great. That, that's clear. Um, why don't you think of or give us one other example of one of those things that move or pumps fear out of the room? Um, sure. That was that was very practical. Yep. So we'll look at this wall board display here. Uh, this is really important because this wall board display is one of our larger projects. It's actually got the, each pink column is two of our developers paired together. So you can see we got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. 12 programmers paired together. The yarn indicates where we are in the week. Uh, so we're in this particular pictorial display. Uh, the yarn says we're at the beginning of the day Tuesday, so the first four days of this five-day cycle have been completed. And then the color-coded sticky dots indicate progress. Yellow says that's a card that's actively being worked on, and because the cards are placed next to the day, you know, a Tuesday card is placed next to Tuesday, so that's when we think it'll be done based on the estimates. This, this transparent wallboard display that is constantly uh, beaconing our status uh, shows where we're ahead and where we're behind uh, to everyone. And so a really important part of manage, controlling managerially generated fear is if, if I looked at this wallboard display and saw that there was a pair that was ahead, uh, which you know a lot of managers consider to be really good news, and I and I call out the parents, hey, you guys are doing awesome, you're way ahead, that's that's great, boy, I'm so glad to see that. Well, the trouble with those kind of statements is they're comparative. Comparisons are almost always odious. There's somebody on the other side of the comparison that's now being made to feel bad because they're behind. Or if I point that out, hey, you guys are behind, are you are you staying late tonight? Now all of a sudden we're starting to put value judgments on information that should be transparent, should be up to date. So we all have to be very careful when we realize that all of the estimates that came out of the team were simply their best guesses at the time. And if we recognize that, if we, if we know that humans make mistakes when they come to guessing how long things are going to take, then we can start to pump fear out of the room. And the next construct we had to teach was actually to teach our project managers that if a team member comes to them and says, hey guys, we just realized we're working on this card that we thought was going to be 8 hours and it turns out it's going to be 16. Right then is the moment where fear can be generated or avoided and we have to teach our project managers in that moment to authentically smile, look them in the eye, 
and say thank you for sharing that information. I know that was hard. I, I know you'd prefer to have been on time. I know that it, it feels bad to, you know, to say you missed, but boy, it's so valuable to hear that from you. It's so valuable because now, now that we know that you're behind, now that you know two hours into this eight-hour card that it's not going to take the eight you thought, it's going to take 16, I can actually go talk to the client. We can adjust our plan based on this newfound information. And right in that conversation is the heart of removing fear in our system. Because we pump an ounce of fear into the room. If we drop one drop of poison in the pond, all cards will be green. People will start saying they're done when they're not. Quality problems will be swept under the rug. Everybody will keep saying everything's okay when it's really not. And then suddenly the project you know, is set to deliver, but it's nowhere close. Software doesn't work. There's bugs everywhere. And that's what fear does. Fear hides bad news. It doesn't make it go away. Great. So let's now shift to a related topic, which is, an organizational system that can inject fear um, to everyone, and that's performance management, which really comes down many times to a performance evaluation. So yep. how do you deal with evaluating performance? And the corollary to that, when someone asks, you know, if, if James is always the one who is wrong or, or, made, or messed up, then how do you deal with poor performers as well as great performers? Sure. Yeah, so uh, interestingly enough, and I'm just going back to a picture uh, that um, might be useful to see here. Uh, let's look at this one. Um, so here's our team at work. Uh, two people, one computer all day long, working on the same task at the same time. The pairs are assigned. We switch them every five working days. So a lot of people wonder, like, well, how do you get to performance then? If Everybody's always working in pairs. Uh, it seems like it would be really hard to judge individual performance. And quite frankly, we're kind of cavalier about it. It's like, I don't care about individual performance. The, and Deming was the one who went after this. He said the, the individual annual performance review is probably one of the most egregious tools American management has ever created because it pits the individual against the team. It glorifies the individual, often at the expense of the team. Lean manufacturing knows this. If you, if you focus all your work and process inventory through the highest performing machine on the plant floor, and then that machine breaks, the entire plant can shut down and produce no output whatsoever. So we are far more focused on the team. That doesn't mean we don't care at all about an individual's efforts along the way and their participation and their engagement. But every Every performance evaluation here is not done by management. We don't have a management structure. All performance evaluation is peer-based. So, you know, Mike, if, if you know, we work together, and every week we, you know, every day when we're paired together, every time I sit down, I say, hey, Mike, I'm really tired today. You know, can you carry us today? Can you pull the two-man bobsled? I'm just sitting back here. You pull me along. Now. Hopefully, uh, you might ask me, Rich, is there something going on in your personal life that I should know about? But let's say you don't. Let's say you just say, okay, I'll carry you. And the next week I get together with Keeley and I do the same thing. And the next week I get together with, with uh, Ben and I do the same thing. And after a while, you know, it becomes really apparent, wow, this guy doesn't do anything. Uh, our whole system is based on the teamwork that results from this pairing. And uh, the highest praise a member of our team can get is when they get promoted from what we call consultant level to senior consultant level. Because that's the moment where the team declares, you are a teacher here. We've noticed your very presence on the team makes the entire team better. Ted, Keeley, our, uh, and Michelle, and Carol are people on our team, Tracy, who have, been, who have been raised up to that status, not by management, but by their peers. And they do it in an open feedback session. We just had one of those today where one of the team members uh, was being evaluated at lunchtime. It's done out in the middle of the room. It's done with their peers. This is not a management-based performance review. Uh, it would be hard for us to do that since we don't have a hierarchy here. Wow, all right. Well, that's certainly different. I'm glad you clarified that. And in that process, 
did you find, you know, was it difficult to get people to accept the fact of a peer review process and to give meaningful uh, feedback and to participate? Or once, you know, they got going with it easy, can you just give a little bit more about that, the process of getting there? Yeah, I think we set the tone right at the beginning when um, in the way we interview. Uh, so the interview process is, mirrors this. Uh, we have an interview process where we don't ask any questions of the interviewee. Uh, we actually put them to work. Uh, we do a mass interview. We bring in 30, 40, 50 people at a time. We pair the interviewees together. We assign one of our team members to observe the two of you working together for 20 minutes working on a paper-based exercise, one pencil, one piece of paper, and one relatively straightforward exercise. This isn't guess how many golf balls it would take to fill up Menlo or anything silly like that. These are practical exercises based on the kind of work we do. And the two people who are assigned to work together, the observer is simply noting their pairing beat. Rich, you still there? I lost you. Hey folks, hang with us for just a minute. Um, try to get Rich back here. I don't know what happened. I'm just going to do it myself. Hi, this is Rich. I'm back again. Sorry about that. Something happened to our phone system. That's all right. That's all right. So, uh, you were talking about uh, the process where you bring a large number of people in, paper-based practical exercises, and pick it up from there. Yeah, yeah and they, they're, they participate in these 20-minute segments where they, uh, they work together uh, for 20 minutes while an observer observes them taking notes of their behavior. We tell them what success looks like. We want them to succeed. This isn't a trick. Uh, we, we repair them after 20 minutes because this simulates our work environment since you're switching pair partners here every five working days. We do this three times and then we send you all home. And then we start talking about what we observed to each of the people who came. How did they pair? How did they behave? Uh, how did they get past their nervousness? Were they open? Were they curious? Were they problem solving in nature? Were they supportive of their pair partner? Well, you can imagine when we start doing this, the reinforcement this puts right at the beginning of our entire process for later asking team members to evaluate their peers. Because even in the interview process, everybody who participated on the Menlo side, all the observers, are already practicing their peer evaluation. And what they're really doing, and this is what I think the most fascinating part of it is, when we get together after the 30 candidates leave, we get the 15 observers together and we sit around for two or three hours over pizza and talk about everybody we saw and what worked and what didn't. It's pretty self-effacing because people start reflecting on, oh, I do that, don't I? Oh, I totally grab the keyboard out of your hands, don't I? I, I bet I talk over people all the time. And they start to realize that our core values are being expressed so fundamentally in this interview process that informs them how they should behave when they're giving peers evaluation, how they should behave when they're being evaluated, and what, is our, what are our values and how do they play out in our culture. Hmm. So one related thing to that is, do you find that that leads to a homogenous um, skill set or a type of person in there, or do you still have diversity that you can leverage through the process? 
Yeah, I think this is the interesting thing is that uh, because of the pairings and because of the switching of the pairs and because our value on a learning organization, the team itself so values cognitive diversity because now it's not a question of, I want everybody to look like me because what they realize is if you look just like me, I'm not going to learn anything from you. And so the, the, uh, the eclectic mix here is almost stunning. And part of it too is we don't look at resumes per se. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't spend a lot of time trying to evaluate, you know, where did you go to school, what grades did you get, what, uh, what degrees did you attain, and what programs and what languages have you learned because we're far more interested in what you're able to learn once you get in the room. And so uh, the, if, you, if you walk through the room and saw just where these people came from, what universities, if they attended them at all, what degree programs they attained, it, it would almost seem like a bizarre mix. Oh, that's interesting. Now you mentioned learning from each other and you want to create a learning organization. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the seniors um, are incredible teachers. Are they the ones that do the teaching or do you expect everyone to teach? No, the expectation is in the pair there's teaching and learning going on every second because let's say I'm the, you know, I'm the silverback, right? You know, I'm, <laughs> I might have been on the team for 15 years or in the industry for 30 and you're the fresh out of college grad, you've got tons to teach me because you've learned the most up-to-date technologies. You've learned the most up-to-date techniques. You might not have the experience that I do. You may, be, uh, you, you may be inclined to drive the bus off the cliff because you've never driven the bus before, and I'm there to keep you safe. But if, if it's always feeling like, well, you just, you just sit back, relax, and I'm going to teach you everything I know, we'd be diminishing... Uh, such a great part of our learning organization by not taking advantage of the most up-to-date things that kids right out of college have learned. And uh, one of the most unique aspects of our Menlo culture is it's very easy for us to take students right out of college. You know, most college kids lament that, you know, most employers tell them, well, as soon as you get two to three years of experience, come see us. And, of course, these kids are smart enough to say, to sense the paradox in that, right? Well, where am I supposed to do that? And I tell these college students, I'm like, you can do that here. This is a great place to, for a first job. Hmm. Interesting. So with the emphasis on pairing, and you got one big room, um, we've got lots of questions about how do you or would you even entertain dealing with remote workers, distributed offices, and so on, because that's one of the commonplace occurrences in many organizations or mandates. Right. Yeah, and we've run a few experiments in that case, but by and large, we are an in-person company that doesn't uh, do work from home, work from vacation, uh, weird office hours. We, we generally speaking are here uh, between 8 and 6 uh, every day. We work 5 days a week. We work 40 hours a week. We never work weekends. We've never had a deny or delay a vacation request. And when and we don't have laptops, so you can't take work home. Uh, there's no VPN connections that you can get in to do work from home. So uh, in some ways, we've created this sort of unnaturally competitive environment because we're all in one room together. But we understand not everybody can enjoy that luxury. And quite frankly, we don't get it 100% of the time either because all of our clients are external to us. So we have to figure out ways to collaborate across geographic boundaries as well when we're dealing with our business clients and so on. Uh, but what I encourage people to think about if they have distributed teams even across a campus or around the world is to figure out what constructs you can build in to build human relationships among your team members. Uh, often org charts are seen as that tool. And it's like, of course, an org chart doesn't build a human relationship. Human contact breeds human relationship. And telephones and electronics and email don't build human relationships. So I often encourage people, if they have the option, if they have the luxury of doing it, is regularly move people around in your team. Move them from office to office. Uh, you know, even if it's just for a few months where it feels more like a vacation than a permanent reassignment of physical location, but if you bring somebody from you know, China to the United States for three months or you send somebody from the United States to China for three months and now you get to 
have a beer with uh, people, maybe get to know their family, get to know their life story, their community, what's important to them, what kind of sports they enjoy, what kind of games they play, all that sort of thing. All of those human relationship constructs go a long way to building the trust it takes to build a really great team. Okay, and a related question to the to the pairing, um, just to take a minute or so to explain this, it's you know, one can see how pairing will work well within a team, but what do you do when you switch pairs across teams or across products or across clients? Do you lose a lot of ground? And how do you deal with that from a productivity perspective? Yeah. Um, you know, part of it is we're practicing this onboarding and, and offboarding every five days. And so because we're switching the pairs every week, uh, er everybody becomes very skilled at, uh, at these um, – onboarding and offboarding moments. And so uh, the team would declare they're able to bring a new person up to speed and, and or they themselves can be brought up to speed in minutes. Uh, and then, but part of that is we've just become so disciplined at it. Part of it too is we're all sitting in an open and collaborative work environment together so we're very close in. So if there's something you and I worked on together and uh, now I'm transferring that knowledge to Ted when I'm paired with Ted, you might only be sitting five feet from me, and I say, "Hey, Mike, how did, uh, what did, how did we do this last? I've forgotten, right?" And so the open and collaborative space supports that as well, for the reminder piece of it. Um, and so uh, there's also this construct that um, uh, we want to knock down towers of knowledge regularly. There's a big problem in our industry where everybody, you know, has these experts that are experts in their area and nobody can help them, which prevents the ability to scale teams up and, quite frankly, even worse, prevents you from being able to scale teams down. And so we're working on that constantly. And uh, by and large, if you're on a project uh, this week, you will likely be on that same project next week. You may be in a different area. Uh, you, you will obviously be with a different pair partner. You'll be working on different story cards in that project. But we'll all be in the same project week in and week out. Over time, those project teams will shift. Uh, you know, there's natural reasons for that. The project is spinning up. The project is spinning down. Somebody goes on vacation. We have to backfill them. And so everybody's used to moving across boundaries. And there's also an expectation here, and I'll just give you an example. If you're a programmer here, you do not focus on a technology. Uh, no, no programmer here would ever say, I'm a Java developer, I'm a database developer, I'm a middleware developer, I'm a front-end developer, I'm an expert in JavaScript. Everybody here says, nope, I'm a programmer. Any given week, I could be in database one week, I could be in front-end. That's almost mind-blowing to people in our industry that it's even possible to do that. And our team does it without even flinching. They actually enjoy it. I mean, it, it gives them a, a very broad perspective. They're, they're very multilingual here. Uh, and we're very, um, uh, which I say, uh, we're, we're, we're a bit cynical about our industry in this regard because uh, you know, everybody asks us, well, you know, what, you know, what technologies do you guys favor? And we kind of look at them and say, well, none of them. We think they all suck, and, but our job is to make them work for our client, and we pick the best technology we can without being biased because of our favorite tool or technology or allegiance that uh, so many in our industry are hooked on. All right, great. Uh, last question. So if you take about one minute here before we finish up. Um, so you talk about customers and working with the product owners or outside customers. Is it really as simple to authorize what's in and what's out of the release as moving pieces of paper on the table? Do you have to do other things? I mean, how do they approve things at the end? Is there something else, or is it just simply that system and they agree to it ahead of time? Yeah, it is that simple. Uh, you know, and of course, getting to that simple isn't easy uh, because you know what's on the card, right. how do those cards get created in the first place, what's the content of them, and so on, is where the hard work occurs. When the client decides that they want us to work on something, that this is the most important next feature on, they pick that card up and they put it on the, the colorful planning sheet. And if they decide against, or at least for now, now it's not a permanent decision like it will never be decided, they leave the card on the table and it won't be worked on. And we think that getting to that level of clarity and lack of ambiguity in the planning process is critical to the speed with which a team can move forward. It's often ambiguity that kills the speed of a team. Okay, great. So 
Um, thanks so much, Rich. This has been an awesome session, especially you know, willing to take questions, mini keynote plus questions. Um, thanks for taking your time doing this. Again, um, as Rich said, there's other things out there, including his book, Joy, Inc. If you, obviously, if you can get by menu, Menlo, go do that. That concludes today's webinar. One event update before we go. Angel Executive Forum 2014 is now open for registration. Go to the URL link listed on the bottom of the slide for more information and to register. This is an event that is limited to 75 executives and is presented by executives for executives. I highly recommend it for you if you're an executive or if you know someone who is who is interested in agility. This year's theme is Enterprise Agility. Once again, thank you for attending and we look forward to having you attend again in the future if you would like to receive automatic notifications, again, go to the link agileleadershipnetwork.org, click on the join button or the specific URL listed on the slide. Thanks again.